in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 4 to 11. Uh, we got started last week, and if you weren't here, I really encourage you to uh, uh, get the CD and, uh, and listen to it. Uh, and uh, we'll give you all the background uh, about Luke, some of the things that uh, probably we're not uh, uh, aware of. And uh, we uh, tried to make at least a little case, but then spent, then spent a lot of time on it, that he was actually the brother of Titus. Uh, that he was Greek. Uh, we gave you the time before we think he was uh, probably saved uh, when men of uh, Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch, uh, Syria, preaching the gospel, and there were many Greeks that were saved during that time. Uh, and through some uh, Roman history uh, and other writings, we, we can try to place uh, Luke being there, uh, there uh, having his, uh, uh, the person that he worked for that probably sponsored him through medical school, Theophilus, Theophilus that was the, uh, uh, his home. Uh, we talked about the fact that he is uh, writing this now uh, on the heels of having written the Gospel of Luke to this same man, uh, introducing him in the first Gospel as Most Excellent uh, Theophilus, which we said was a government Roman title, so he's a, he's a Roman official. Uh, when he writes here, as we saw last week, he just basically says Theophilus. So certainly it's something that's changed and transpired after this man received the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and, of course, uh, a lot of writers uh, believe that it's because he's come to faith in Christ, so there's just a different relationship between the two of them. We talked about the fact that Luke uh, was the one guy that was with Paul through it all. Now, uh, we'll see a shift in chapter 16 as he'll go from, uh, from second person to uh, first person plural. He'll then say, we did this, and we went here, and we saw this, and so forth. So Luke is right along with him. Uh, in the shipwreck, in the imprisonment, and so everything that takes place after chapter 16. We also talked about the fact that uh, uh, one of the uh, cross-references in the epistles, he mentions the fact that uh, Luke is a fellow laborer, uh, along with uh, the others that are really part of his ministry team that he had developed. Therefore, Luke is not just Paul's private physician, which, which the man probably needed so, uh, many times since he got beat up. Uh, but he's actually somebody out there preaching the gospel as well, which again makes him the first medical missionary uh, as well. Not, not saying that tongue-in-cheek, that's really who he, who he was. He was a doctor. Uh, he didn't just uh, practice medicine and help people, but he was out, out there evangelizing as well. And then finally, he is the one guy that is left, if you read the end of 2 Timothy, uh, when, uh, when Paul is writing to, uh, to Timothy, uh, from the Mamertine prison there in Rome, which is basically, a, as we said, a hole in the ground that is uh, still there today. And he'll re he remarks that uh, uh, the only one left with me at this point is Luke. And uh, Luke is there with him to the very end. Uh, Luke is the one, according to church history, that uh, buries the body of the Apostle Paul uh, when he was beheaded outside Rome, approximately 68 uh, AD. That was our little background. Uh, we get here to a very important uh, part of Scripture because we hit verse 8, which helps us outline the book. Certainly, uh, it, it is uh, pivotal. Uh, it's so important, uh, as we'll see from Jesus, that he did not want these guys to even go out and begin to evangelize the world until the Holy Spirit uh, had come upon them. In the first uh, uh, verses 4 and 5, we'll look at the request of Jesus to wait and uh, make reference to why that was so important. Verse 68, we'll see the specific reason the gift will be given. Uh, and then verses 9 to 11, Jesus is received into the heavens. So let's jump into verse 4. And being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And not many days from now. So the request here is to wait for the promise Verse 4, it's the promise of the Father. Uh, I've used the word request because uh, that was just the best I could do. It's a command. He just commands them, you'll see, uh, to just wait. And wait for a specific day. The Spirit is coming. You won't have to wait very long. It's coming on a specific day. It's coming on the day of Pentecost. So 50 days after Passover, uh, Jesus, according to Luke, appeared to them for over a period of 40 days. So it wasn't very long uh, that they needed to wait in this upper room for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, the Spirit is given by God's sovereign grace. Uh, they receive it not somehow because of their worthiness, but again, just by the grace of God, as each and uh, every one of us receive it today. Uh, I'll quote several times from uh, R.A. Torrey in his classic work but on this subject. Uh, he says there's an apparent uh, imperative need 
that something be done at once. The whole world was perishing, and they alone knew the saving truth. Nevertheless, Jesus certainly charged them, wait. What a testimony to the all-importance of the baptism with the Holy Spirit as a preparation for the work that shall be acceptable to Christ. In other words, we could say, to use a figure of speech, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and there's a handful of people that know the truth of how to get saved. And Jesus doesn't say, get out there and start telling them the truth right away. He says, no, don't go anywhere, don't do anything. You go there and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Uh, fairly important then. Uh, if it's important for them, certainly it's important for us as we'll look at the reason for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, secondly, the request is to wait. And, uh, and so uh, it's compared to baptism. And certainly we're, uh, uh, we see that in verse 5. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, John the Baptist announced a future baptism of the Holy Spirit as part of his ministry. Jesus had promised the uh, coming uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, and went into great detail what we call the upper room discourse. So John 14, 15, 16, uh, he goes through a lot of information trying to prep these guys in that uh, upper room for his soon departure and help them understand the importance that the Holy Spirit would, uh, would play in their lives. He'll lead you into all truth. He'll be your counselor. He'll show you the things of me and make them known to you. And he goes through some very important things about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that certainly is for them, but also for us. We'll make reference to a couple of those verses as we go along. Uh, the word baptism or baptizo in the Greek means to immerse or to plunge. That's why when we... We go down to the, the beach down here, go to Kailua Beach, uh, and uh, we're going to do a baptism. Uh, we talk to the folks about uh, what baptism is, uh, what's happening, the reason we're doing it, this public confession of, uh, of Christ and so forth. Uh, it's uh, a demonstration of going in the water, coming out of the water, a picture of going in the grave, coming out of the grave, a resurrection. It's an identify, identification with Jesus Christ. And then we go on down and uh, to the beach, uh, and just to make the obvious point, uh, the water does not baptize people. I baptize them. <laughs> uh, they don't just walk out and suddenly the water, I guess if, if there was good surf, the water could baptize them without me. Uh, they might want me there to kind of hold them, uh, hold them upright, but uh, the idea is that I baptize them in water. So when uh, he says here that the Holy Spirit will baptize you, again, in the same way that people are baptized into the realm of the water, we are baptized into the realm of the Spirit, but it's Jesus that is doing the baptizing. So that's important to know. That's his, uh, uh, his illustration here. Jesus will be the one that baptizes into the realm of the Spirit. It's the illustration of water baptism, but uh, in a spiritual context. So the request to wait for the promise of the Father, obviously uh, very important. And, of course, the disciples are, are listening. Uh, uh, there's a few things in the Greek that would indicate that they're, they're sitting down and possibly eating, and they're having this conversation. He's trying to prep them for his uh, you know, soon ascension and so forth. So as he begins to talk about the things of the Spirit, the coming of the Spirit and so forth, uh, they ask a question that seems to us kind of off the wall, but actually it's, it's a very good question. Uh, it would be a normal question for them to ask. They're going to say, well, if the Spirit is coming here, are you about ready to set up your kingdom? And that's because Joel, Isaiah, many of the Old Testament prophets associated with, and it will happen, when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom and rule and reign from Jerusalem, there will be a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They, they knew that. So when he talks about this baptism of the Holy Spirit, wait for the Spirit, you know, well, we'll see. They bring this whole issue up in verse 6 as we'll get to the specific reason the gift is given. He says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, shall come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So he does respond to their question from, uh, uh, from verse 6. And again, it's a, it's a natural question for them to, uh, to ask. Uh, but basically, uh, they're exhibiting a, a certain level of faith that maybe they didn't have before. Jesus has died. He's rose again. 
He's been appearing to them, ministering to them, teaching them for a period of 40 days. And he talks about an outpouring of the Spirit. All right, where are you going to establish your kingdom? Because we believe you can. And we believe it's just a matter of if it's God's will and this is if it's God's time. We believe you will. Uh, so that's a good thing, that they believe that uh, Jesus can establish his kingdom right then. And after all, Jesus had taught them, via through them to us, to pray for this very thing. Over in uh, Luke 11, 2, Jesus said, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Of course, what we call the Lord's Prayer continues. But we're actually all supposed to be praying for, the, for God's kingdom to, uh, to come. And it will come uh, at one point in time uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, when we uh, were on our, our tour to Israel, I had the privilege of teaching right there what would be Armageddon in, in that area. Uh, and I actually read the Lord's Prayer and said, for centuries Christians have been praying this prayer, and right here where you're standing is where this prayer is going to be answered. Jesus is going to come back. He is going to establish his kingdom. And this is where some of those major events begin to happen in what we call the Battle of Armageddon. Again, not one particular event, but a series of events as the Lord returns. They're looking for his kingdom to come. But he uses a word here in the Greek. We get it in, uh, in English, but. And that sounds like a word of contrast. Uh, but literally, it's, uh, it's a word of great contrast. And he says, you're concerned about the kingdom coming. He's not saying that's a wrong thing. He says uh, it's got a set time. It's got a set season. The Father knows it's going to happen. But, but in the meantime, uh, there's something else that you need in a greater way. We're not going to have a military takeover and drive out the Romans. I'm not going to establish my kingdom. But God's kingdom is going to be established in the hearts of men and women. The nation might have rejected me as the Messiah. But now, as we know from our studies in Romans, individuals will come to faith uh, in me, uh, and of course we'll see the church established there in Acts 2. So secondly, he reminds them of the promise of the Father, verse 8, but, there's our word of contrast, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now he's already mentioned it, he's already talked about it, uh, and over in Luke 24, our same writer, in verse 49, says, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, uh, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit come upon them uh, in a very unique way. And here's where we want to kind of make a distinction. We would say, <coughs> according to the scriptures here, that the Holy Spirit coming upon them is a different and subsequent experience apart from salvation itself. Over in John 20, uh, we'll see that the, the apostles, the believers here, have already been, we would say, born again of God's Spirit. Uh, there in uh, John 20, 21, it says, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. I would say if the Son of God stands before you, and he breathes on you and says, Receive the Holy Spirit, I think you probably received the Holy Spirit. I'm just <laughs> guessing. So they, they're already, we would say, born again of God's Spirit. Uh, and, uh, and that is true of each and every one of us. When we come to faith in Christ, we receive God's Holy Spirit uh, in us. Just a couple of references in regards to that to make sure we're on the same page. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says this, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the one spirit. In Ephesians 4.30, Paul says, we're all, as believers, sealed with the Holy Spirit. So when you and I, uh, whether we got down on our knees, said a prayer in our bedroom at home, walked forward at an altar call, whatever it might be, or we said, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, and I place my faith in you and your death on the cross for my sins, and I believe in your resurrection, Come in and cleanse my heart and uh, make me new. Uh, God then does several things. Again, from our study of Romans, he gives us a new nature. Uh, but he also gives us the Holy Spirit. Paul makes reference to our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So like the apostles in John 20, all of us when we come to faith 
receive the Holy Spirit. Now we spent even some time talking about what happens then. The Holy Spirit works in us to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. We did a whole sermon along with our Roman study uh, about walking in the Spirit from 2 Corinthians 3.18. We with all men unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness by the Spirit. Uh, Old King James says from glory to glory, from strength to strength. Uh, God's Spirit comes in us and begins to transform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we wish that process would move along a little quicker. Uh, sometimes we're amazed that, uh, that it's working at all, knowing how stubborn we can be. And in that study, we actually looked at some of the reasons why. It's a slow process sometimes, and other times it seems like God is really uh, working in us. And a lot of that had to do with our time uh, in the Word. Uh, God is in our hearts, working in our bodies, our temple, the Holy Spirit, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ when we receive the Lord, just like the apostles here. Everybody okay so far? Well, let's move on, because I actually said that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate in, in a subsequent experience to that particular experience, and that's what our subject is here. One other thought here, though, is that we never have to worry about losing the Holy Spirit as they did in the Old Testament. Psalm 51.11, there David prayed, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So sometimes we, that's been put to music, of course, and we sing that song very theologically incorrect for New Testament believers, because the Lord's not going to do that. He did in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come upon prophets, priests, and kings, and anoint them for a particular activity or something that they needed to do. And then the Holy Spirit would depart as well uh, from uh, each and every one of them. And so David prays, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We never have to pray that. Uh, the Holy Spirit will never, uh, never leave us. But notice uh, Jesus says again here in verse 8 to these folks that have already been born again of God's Spirit. He says, there's something else for you in the future. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come uh, upon you. Now he uses here uh, a different Greek preposition in talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And uh, I, again, uh, it'd be certainly a great study just to go right through this whole upper room discourse in John's Gospel. But uh, we just want to highlight a couple of verses for you. There in John 14, 16, we're going to see a different uses uh, in regards to the Holy Spirit in terms of these prepositions. Uh, very important. We'll read it and then come back and explain. Here it says uh, in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. John 14, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is actually with you now. Sometime in the future, he actually will be in you. He's not in you now, he's with you now. And he's with us before we come to faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is with us. He comes and convicts us of sin. Uh, we begin to realize that we truly uh, need a Savior and need to be forgiven. We often pray for our loved ones and family members and those we come in contact. We pray that the Lord will send the Holy Spirit, that he will be with them and convict them of their sin. So they'll reach out, call out for a Savior. That was true of the apostles. He was with them. Later in John 20, Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So now they have the Spirit in them. But now Jesus says, now subsequent in the future, apart from that, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Again, so the three Greek prepositions, the upon is uh, epi or epi, epi, the word uh, with is para, P-A-R-A, and of course the word in is in, but it's E-N, at least transliterated into, uh, into English letters. So three Greek prepositions, very important. The Holy Spirit comes with a person to convict them of their own sins. We pray to receive Christ and the Holy Spirit comes with us, in us. He is never going to leave us, and he will do the work of conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. That's his primary mission. Now, Jesus talks a lot about the Holy Spirit uh, being our counselor, our helper, and so forth. Uh, other important uh, act activities as well, or ministries that uh, he does in and through our lives. But here, this is very different. 
the Holy Spirit is going to come upon them. And the reason for that is, uh, we see in 2C, and you shall be witnesses to me. It's not to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. It's so that we can be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Not everybody has the gift of evangelism. We would all say amen to that. I mean, if you've been around, if you've been around my brother-in-law Stride, you go, that guy's got the gift of evangelism. I've never sat down to a table, I've never been with him that he didn't say hello to a person and then hand him a track. It just doesn't, you know, if, it, if he didn't do it, I, you know, I'd be like, what happened here, you know? But uh, he's definitely, he, he just, I don't think he can breathe a, a day without sharing the gospel with somebody. And he's, he's good at it, he's gifted at it. We're not all really gifted that well. It's kind of tough. We've got to pray for boldness. We pray for the Lord to help us. But we can all be witnesses. We can all tell people what we've heard and what we've seen in regard to Jesus. And that's, and that's what a witness is. We, we can all do that. Witness is a key word in the book of Acts. It's used 29 times. It's either a verb or, or a noun. Again, as a witness is someone who tells simply what they've seen in a, or heard. You went into a courtroom, you put your hand on a Bible, and you swore to tell the truth. The judge would not be interested in your opinions or what you thought. He just wants to know, what did you see? What did you hear? That's a, that's a witness. And all of us can do that. The Greek word for witness is martyr. When we think of someone that is a martyr, we think of someone who has died for their faith. And, uh, and certainly that did occur with these witnesses, the apostles. It does occur around the world today with Christians. The idea is the Holy Spirit comes upon me and gives me a power to be his witness, to tell people what I've seen and what I've heard about Jesus Christ. And I will do that, and I'm willing to do that no matter what the circumstances may be. How, how, do, how do I possibly do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we really don't have the, the ability in and of ourselves uh, this word occurs, again, several times in, uh, in the book of Acts itself. Uh, for example, in Acts 2.32, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, Peter says. Acts 3, uh, verse 14, Peter's still preaching. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Uh, Acts 22.15, for you will be his witnesses to all men of what you have, there it is, have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. To be his witnesses, his credential, his uh, evidences, his arguments to those that are around us uh, is the idea that uh, we need a power to come upon us from the Holy Spirit uh, to be able to, to do this. And what do we say? What have we seen and heard? Something of marvelous simplicity. That God loves people. And we've come to experience that, and we know that. In fact, uh, that's the Hawaiian word for the God that we worship. Aloha keakua. He is the God of love. That's a very simple message to deliver, especially to people in, in this culture, to understand that uh, uh, who, are, who are just starving and want to know that somebody somewhere does love them. Oh, that's the simplicity of the message. But there's a problem because we've been separated from that God because of our sin. Not only the things we've done, but the things we haven't done. As Jesus says in the Beatitudes, even the things that we've even thought, our sin has separated us from a holy and a righteous God who is the God of love. His solution was uh, to prevent us from being punished because of that sin, to send his son to die on the cross for our sins so that we might be forgiven. We simply place our faith in him and we're forgiven. That's the message. You know, it's, it's a simple message. Uh, but it certainly takes, uh, takes courage. Uh, and it takes a, a power to come upon us to be able to faithfully deliver that message uh, each uh, and every day. But it's why Paul was able to reach the Praetorium Guards, these, we would say, special forces guys within uh, Caesar's uh, uh, own household at times. These guys are the cream of the crop. Uh, they've seen a lot, a lot of combat, a lot of battle time. Many of them came to faith in Christ from this little, this little bent over Jewish guy who was kind of an intellectual type, not your warrior type. But he just delivered a simple message uh, endued by the power of the Holy Spirit. George Whitfield was a great preacher of uh, what we call the Second Great Awakening. 
Frisia, not only in the United States, but also uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, but uh, didn't do a lot of his preaching uh, in churches. Uh, he would just go out to where the people were. So if he was trying to reach farmers or coal miners, he'd get up and preach at uh, 5, 6 in the morning so they could hear it before they went off to work because everybody still had to, had to work that day if they, if they wanted to eat. So it was a, uh, an uncommon sight to see people uh, uh, headed down cobblestone streets to the edge of the town to hear a guy named George Whitfield preach the gospel. What well, was unusual that on a given morning, a man named David Hume, a famous Scottish philosopher and a critic <coughs> and a skeptic of the Bible and of uh, all of Christianity, he also had gotten up early to head down to hear George Whitfield. When asked about it, one person said, I thought you didn't believe in the gospel. And Hume replied, I don't, but he does. He was, he was so courageous in his faith and proclamation of the gospel that even David Hume wanted to hear him. I don't believe it, but i got to hear this guy because he believes it. That's somebody that's had the Holy Spirit come upon them, and they're just simply telling what they've heard and seen. Again, the command to be Christ's witnesses uh, is not an easy thing, uh, but it becomes a much more natural thing given the Holy Spirit coming upon us. And I, I have to just tell you one story. I remember uh, Greg Laurie sharing a number of years ago. Uh, you know, he got saved at uh, Harbor High School there in Southern California. Uh, you know, it's some kind of a noon, noon kind of rally thing and stuff. And eventually found himself at uh, uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Heard a message like this delivered and uh, went forward uh, into a prayer room to uh, to pray. And you know, he didn't really know what, what to expect. He didn't really know much about Christianity, so he didn't really know what to expect or anything. Uh, he had heard, heard stories of other people and, and had great experiences and so forth. And you know, he didn't know if he'd hear a choir of angels when somebody prayed for him. Uh, he'd hear uh, bells ringing or, or not. Uh, but if you need to hear it, the bells, I actually have an app for it on my phone. So I <laughs> kind of a little chiming going on uh, while we're praying, if, uh, if that helps you. Uh, but uh, he says, I, I didn't experience anything. The guy prayed for me. Okay, hey, thank you. Great. Uh, and then he left. And uh, this is kind of going, going back a long time, so I've kind of filled some of the, uh, you younger folks in. Uh, there was a time when, if you wanted something uh, late at night to eat, there was only one place you could go. The only place open was Jack in the Box. That was their thing. Everything else closed early, but Jack in the Box was open late. So he's going to Jack in the Box. But also in those days, uh, the early days of Jack in the Box, where you dro drove through to order, it was actually a Jack in the Box. I mean, it was you know, the Jack in the Box. And, uh, you know, Jack in the Box. Uh, you should have a visual. But uh, anyway, Greg said he had a little beat up Rusty Volkswagen. Pulled around uh, to the drive through fresh from having been prayed at at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. And he's not really sure what happened, uh, but he spent about 15 minutes witnessing to uh, Jack in the Box. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody on the other end of it, but he was just witnessing to the Jack in the Box. And then he realized something had transpired because he'd certainly never, never done that before. Dramatic change in his life. I, I know even for, for myself, I remember the first time I was at Calvary Honolulu, I heard a message like this, Pastor Bill prayed just, you know, for everybody at the end. And I, I prayed and I uh, just, you know, thought that was great. You know, that was awesome. I, you know, I just, whatever. I just want whatever the Lord's got for me and I need all the help I can get, I figured, you know. And, uh, you know, I kind of wasted enough of my life. I want to try to do something for the Lord. Knew I couldn't do it on my own. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give me one of those, you know, and, you uh, I may have to pray for that uh, each and every day. Well, I remember we were doing a, uh, still doing craft fairs back in those days. Kathy and I uh, doing her uh, sewing dresses. I'm still building uh, stained glass windows and did a bunch of gift item stuff to sell. Anyway, where where I'm I'm find myself sitting on the lawn on Sunday afternoon or over the weekend, and I'm I'm talking to this guy. I've known him for years. Jewish guy, investment broker, uh, very intellectual, highly educated, like the last guy on the planet that I would ever share my faith with, right? And yet, here he was. I, I don't even know how we got there. But I'm, I spend like 30, 40 minutes sharing my whole testimony, sharing the gospel with him. He was, seemed very interested, asking lots of questions. And, and I just remember like thinking, well, that was awesome. And walking back to where my booth was, and then I was uh, neglecting my customers by that point, so I was walking back in that way. And it just kind of occurred to me, I can't believe I just did that. You know, and I, I realized that. I think I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I think God gave me this power to be a witness for him. Uh, and I could go on and on with, uh, with the stories. 
uh, again, what would come upon them? Uh, well, he could have used a couple of different words for power. He could have used kratos in the Greek, which means authority or domination. But of course, he uses the Greek word dunamis, where we get our word in English, uh, dynamic or dynamite, uh, actually. A dynamic power is what would come upon us. Uh, it's a power that was always available. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. It wasn't that it wasn't available, but uh, man had never been baptized into the realm of the Spirit uh, to be able to experience this for himself and have this kind of result uh, in terms of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, how was the result? Well, Jesus gives the results, and he says it's going to be worldwide. Verse 8, and you shall be uh, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So uh, this, had, this was like a shocking statement to, to the disciples. You know, just keep in mind, this is very early on, uh, their concept of, uh, of Christianity, what we call Christianity today, is it is another sect of Judaism. And as far as they're concerned, the only people they're going to be sharing the gospel with would be other Jewish people. Uh, and it's like that for, for a while. I mean, they, they kind of had to get some, uh, uh, some things straight in their own mind through the scriptures, through the experience of going up and seeing what Philip was doing in Samaria. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, Peter over, staying with Tanner, uh, Simon the, uh, the Tanner, and then eventually to Cornelius' house. And, and then they got to go and defend all this stuff in Acts 15 to the boys there in Jerusalem to try to figure out why, why this was okay that they actually went into a Gentile's house, much less shared the gospel, much less they had the same experience we had in, uh, uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, so Jesus is saying, yeah, well, you're, you're going to go to Ju Jerusalem. Got that. Judea, Samaria. Judea, uh, I'm not too sure about Samaria. I don't think we'll be going there, but go ahead. Uh, into the uh, uttermost parts of the world. Are there Jewish people in the uttermost parts? Maybe we could go. This was uh, just mind-blowing, staggering. Uh, this this concept uh, that they would be so changed. And of course, the courage it would take to take the gospel uh, around the world. And we mentioned uh, Thomas uh, and his uh, dying the death of a martyr in India. Uh, Kent Hughes says, too often we are uh, overly concerned about personal comfort. If the Christian faith is worth believing at all, it is worth believing heroically. I like that phrase. If, if this is really true, if it's worth believing it at all, it's worth going for it. It's worth believing it heroically. And of course, we had some wonderful examples of that through the testimony of Wes Bentley being with us here uh, just a few weeks ago and, uh, and what those chaplains do for the uh, South Sudanese Army, who their last class before they graduate is a class on martyrdom. So they're, they're ready for it when it, uh, when it comes their ways. When the Holy Spirit comes upon the followers of Christ, the most unlikely people in the world become powerful witnesses for him. And all i got to say, I'm just glad Jesus picked a bunch of bumbling idiots to be his, uh, his apostles. Otherwise, it would have been discouraging, man, if he'd gone to Jerusalem and got the cream of the crop, man. Uh, these guys are just fishermen. They were just kind of uh, tough guys, you know, out there in the sun working all day for a living. These are the guys that no rabbi said, come follow me. And they were pretty shocked when Jesus said it to them. Uh, and yet their lives are radically different. Uh, again, once they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. So the request of Jesus is to wait. Uh, obviously very important. The specific reason uh, is because of the promise that you, it, uh, of the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness. Uh, and the results would eventually be worldwide. And it was, of course. Uh, to their known world to what they knew, their known world, the Roman world. They, they took the gospel to their known world in, the, in one generation. And certainly a lot of that was uh, cross-cultural. Uh, the third thing here is Jesus is received into the heavens, verse 9 to 11. When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said... Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So again, it's a cloud uh, that receives him. Uh, we see in verse 9, 
Uh, again, we don't really uh, get it uh, in the English, but uh, in the Greek, he was very gradually taken up. So, uh, you know, the movies or the flammograph, they kind of kind of get that. It was a very gradual thing they were watch, uh, watching happen. Uh, it could have just been a, a normal cloud, could have been a cloudy day, but uh, I uh, personally think it was the Shekinah glory of God, God's presence uh, that we see many times in Scripture in the form of a cloud. Uh, it was a cloud that led the children of Israel by day through the wilderness wandering. Uh, it was a cloud that uh, stayed over and signified God's presence over the tabernacle. Uh, and when God's presence left the temple uh, prior to its uh, destruction, uh, Ezekiel saw uh, God's presence in the form of a cloud leave the temple, go up to, uh, through the east gate, up the Mount of Olives, and then up into heaven. And of course, it was a cloud, a special cloud, again, the Shekinah glory of God. That was over what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, with Peter, James, and John. Uh, had the testimony of, uh, of Moses and Elijah appearing, and of course uh, the words, uh, this is my son, uh, listen to him or obey him, uh, all involving a cloud. So I think this is a, a supernatural experience, and it wasn't just a cloudy day. Jesus received, but there's an exhortation to the disciples in verse 11. Uh, Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? It's kind of, it's almost kind of comical. You can imagine these guys, they're, they're watching Jesus and he's going, I don't know if they're crying, I don't know if they're weeping, I don't know if they're just like, man, I can't believe this is happening. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? You know, as this whole thing didn't just happen real fast, they're just kind of watching it. Uh, and then these two guys show up and uh, I uh, suspect that they were angels. They could kind of exhort the apostles and they're kind of like, hey, whatever you say. And uh, I don't know if white was a big color in the first century for guys. I'm just thinking it's not, you know. And so there's a little designation here. Uh, but basically what they're saying is that, uh, uh, you know, hey, Jesus is returning again. So get out of here. <laughs> go do what he told you to do. Uh, go to that upper room and wait for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Again, three reasons we would say that Jesus needed to be received into heaven. One is that he might send the Holy Spirit. He'd already told them that in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you, uh, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. Jesus is saying it's necessary I go. Hey, it's to your advantage. I mean, I can be here and be with you guys. But if I, can, if I leave and send the Holy Spirit, uh, he can be in and indwell uh, every, every believer. Uh, every believer that asks can be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be a witness for him. Secondly, in heaven he acts as our high priest. That's from Hebrews 4.14. There, the writer says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is our great high priest. He is the one that can stand before God the Father on our behalf uh, perfectly because he became a man. He was tempted in every way. He's experienced everything that you've experienced, uh, at least to a general sense. He understands. Uh, he's been through it. Uh, and he can perfectly intercede for us uh, on, on behalf of our needs and hear our prayers. Uh, thirdly, in heaven, he is our advocate. That's from 1 John uh, 2, 1. Uh, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours, ours only, but also for the whole world. Uh, Jesus Christ, the, his blood was sufficient to pay for the price of everyone in the world in terms of their sin. Is everyone saved? No. Everybody individually must come to him. But his death on the cross was a sufficient propitiation. That is a gift that was given in order to turn away the wrath of God. He is our advocate. He's our high priest. He understands. Advocate like someone that speaks on our behalf. When Satan comes, as in the story of Job, and appears before the throne of God to make an accusation against you and I, we've got a pretty good attorney, Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's good to know. Therefore, we listen to him. We don't have to listen to the condemnation of, of Satan. Uh, Jesus leaves and ascends into heaven for three very good reasons. But what I want to do in a moment is just, is just pray. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, even when folks came forward uh, after Wes Bentley's uh, message a few weeks ago to say, yeah, <laughs> compared to those guys, I'm like Barney Fife uh, of a Christian, you know, when we talk about these guys that uh, are over there in the Sudan and what they're willing to go to. Are you committed enough? Absolutely not. And so that was a natural response. So let's just, hey, let's just pray and say, Lord, I, I want to be more committed to you. No, when I, I came up, I prayed for you, for the folks in both services, and uh, actually I was just praying for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a lot of us that have come to faith in Christ, uh, and at some point in time, uh, we've prayed this prayer. We've prayed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, to be filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in reality, I appreciate what Pastor Chuck said at a, at a walk conference uh, probably a decade or so ago when he was uh, with us. Uh, he gave a message, again, similar to this and said, Said, you know, some people call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a second filling, a second work of grace. He says, you know what? I don't care what you call it, just get it. You know, and that's our only concern here, so that we can be witnesses for the Lord. Uh, the point I'm leading to is that we'll find the apostles, the disciples, asking to be filled many times, over and over and over again in our study of the book of Acts. So it is generally, it is generally an experience subsequent in a part and different from that of salvation. Is it always? No, we're going to see Cornelius, Peter preaches, and boom, they get the whole, I want to say the holy enchilada, that, that's probably not the best metaphor, but they get it all at, at one time. Uh, the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants to do, and uh, possibly that's, that's happened to somebody here. So whether it was there or it was later, uh, we still need to keep asking to be filled once again. But if you've never been asked, that Lord, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. What's going to happen? Well, we pray that he gives you power so that you'll love other people the way that he wants us to love them. So that we'll be a witness to be able to tell what we've heard and what we've seen. And, uh, and it's difficult to do it without it. How critical? Well, with his own disciples, he said, you just go and wait till this happens. Now, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go to an upper room. We don't have to have Terry meetings or anything else. We just simply ask, uh, and the Lord is so gracious uh, to give the Spirit to us. But let me read one example to you uh, of the book of Acts and how these men and women continue to ask for and receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4.31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place where they are assembled together was shaken, uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were filled with the Spirit once again. Verse 33, And with great power the apostles gave what? Witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And a great grace was upon them all. So it's, uh, it's something we pray for often. Again, a, a couple more auditory quotes. I can't help myself. He says, We need to be filled again and again and again with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes ask, have you received a second blessing? Yes, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and hundreds besides. And I'm looking for a new blessing today. That's, uh, that's the attitude we should, we should have and that we're going to pray for. Because it's not easy. It's not easy out there. It's a difficult world. It just got a little darker. It just got a little darker here in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago with the passage of the uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, we're doing what we can. We just did what we could. Uh, in terms of a church to uh, rewriting our articles of incorporation to try to help protect us on the legal side. Uh, we're doing uh, what we can. We'll see, we'll see what uh, we have for us. But uh, again, uh, it's, uh, you know, sometimes the, uh, the darker it gets, the, the, the lighter, uh, the brighter, even a small light will, will shine. You know, you may not uh, think that little flashlight on your, your phone is too good until you get off the bus at night in Kahuku and you hear the dogs barking. <laughs> and it's like, that's a pretty good light. <laughs> it's the only one I got. And I can't see my hand in front of my face. I'm, I'm speaking from experience here, you can tell. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to uh, ne not necessarily get easier out there. Uh, we need the power of God to be his witnesses. Again, Tori says, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not primarily intended to make believers happy nor holy, but to make them useful. Well, will I be happier then? Not necessarily. It's, it's so that God will make you useful. I mean, we, were, we were on the mainland. We were in Colorado. We were driving uh, one of the interstate freeways, probably uh, Denver, going down toward uh, uh, 
Colorado Springs to, to visit Josh when he was at the academy there. And uh, I saw this big church on the side of the, uh, the freeway and, this, and the, the sign on it that said, the happy church. And I just thought, probably not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and I Googled it later. It's not. Uh, it's, you know, we're, you know God, God is not, uh, didn't send his son to die on a cross for our sins so we could be a little happier. You know, uh, it's so that we could have our sins forgiven. Uh, that we could have a relationship with him so we could spend all eternity with him. Uh, and we want to be able to tell other people what we've seen and what we've heard. Uh, and sometimes it's just difficult. And we need the filling of the Spirit. That power that uh, enables us to do that very thing. That's what I think anyway. I hope you'll agree with me. Well, let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we... Uh, just want to pray for uh, each and every one. I would hope that each and every one would say, yeah, I, I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need that power because there are just times that I, I wish I were a better witness, and, uh, and I'm not. All, all of us can relate to that. Lord, so I pray for uh, anyone that, um, Lord, they, uh, they know you already, but, uh, and this is kind of a new, a new thing. But it's just, uh, it's a Bible thing. It's right there in, in the book of Acts. And we're going to see these men and women used tremendously by you. And we're going to be inspired and excited by your lives. But it's just not a story of inspiration. These are examples. This is here to teach us so that we, like them, could literally turn our world upside down for you. So we pray for those that maybe have never prayed this prayer before. And we pray for... Uh, everyone else that maybe has prayed many times, Lord, fill me afresh uh, once anew. Sometimes we even sing that uh, in our worship songs. And so, Lord, we just come to you now. We pray that you'd baptize us with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. We might have that dynamic power. Lord, so that our, our witnessing uh, for you, our giving our testimony or just sharing about you, it would just, it would just be the, the most natural overflow out of our hearts, Lord. You'd fill us with your love. Uh, that love would then overflow to others around us. Lord, that's what we uh, long for. That's what we're asking for. And that's what you, you promised to give in the scriptures. So Lord, by faith, even as the way that we are saved, we pray by faith once again. Just fill us afresh and anew. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.